Welcome to The Heal Podcast. I'm Kelly Noonan-Gores, and every week I speak to the leading doctors, healers, spiritual teachers, and scientists to find out what is truly possible when it comes to healing. I also interview real people with extraordinary healing stories. My philosophy is what's possible for one is possible for all. On today's episode of The Heal Podcast, I sit down with the beautiful Dr. Shamani Jan, the founder and CEO of the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, or CHI, a nonprofit collaborative that leads humanity to heal ourselves. Dr. Jan is an Ivy League trained clinical psychologist and an award winning research scientist in psychoneuroimmunology and integrative medicine. She is a sought after speaker and teacher in mind, body, spirit healing. We talk about her new book, Healing Ourselves, Biofield Science and the Future of Health, and how her work is bridging the gap between spirit, energy, medicine, and science, which is absolutely essential for the next evolution of medicine and true healing. We nerd out on the science behind energy healing, connection, and consciousness, and I am so excited to share Shamani's paradigm-shifting work with you today. Shamani, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Kelly. It's a pleasure. So, oh my gosh, I have so much to talk to you about. Um, I, I loved your book. You just came out with a new book called Healing Ourselves, Biofield Science and the Future of Health. And what I love about your work is that, like many others that I've interviewed on the podcast, is you are a bridge. You are bridging uh, science and spirituality. You are proving some of these you know, through real scientific research, um, you know, studies in, in biofield science and, and energy healing. And it's so important because as we'll talk about, the system hasn't really supported research in those fields because of, you know, pressure and, and judgment from, from peers and academia, et cetera. So um, can you just tell us a little bit about your background? Um, because there's spirituality that's kind of in your upbringing. Uh, and how you came to be so passionate about studying biofield science and energy healing. Yeah, you bet, Kelly. You know, like everyone, I think I have a yearning to move out of these models of separatism that we have, you know, kind of plaguing our planet at the moment where we all feel separated from each other. We, you know, feel either like we don't belong or, you know, that uh, we're disconnected in some way. And so a really salient example for that in my life was realizing that I was growing up in I was born and raised in the South, all of my friends were Baptist Christian, and I grew up in a Jan spiritual tradition. And what was neat about that was that they were eager to learn about what we did. And I was eager to learn about what they did, probably because we were kids, right? So I would go to church with them. And they would ask me questions about why we didn't eat meat and you know, different things like that. But when I went to school, I realized that all the spiritual type discussions that I might have with my friends outside of school, we didn't really discuss at school. And as I became more and more fascinated with healing and consciousness, I realized that those things seemed off limits at school. It just wasn't something that we talked about in college. I mean, I remember vividly, you know, in my undergraduate studies at Columbia University in the 90s, the brain had just come online you know everybody was super excited to study the brain the brain and we were looking at what parts of the brain lit up you know when we did certain things and that was really neat but if you even mention consciousness back then everyone looked at you like you were nuts and they were teaching us that the brain didn't change after age seven and i remember thinking wait a minute how can they say that and as a young scientist i was looking at the data and i said there's not really a lot of studies here what are they basing this on And I think because of my own spiritual upbringing, what we learned in our cosmology is that everything is connected. Everything is part of an interconnected system. And so I started wondering about why we were studying things like the brain and the body at that time, even as separate systems. And as I went into my studies in an area called psychoneuroimmunology, we joke that if you can say that seven times really fast, you get your degree. <laughs> Nobody can say that word. So we say PNI for short. So we can just say PNI. PNI is the study of the interconnection between the mind and the body. And so because of PNI, we learned that 
our brain wasn't this separate sort of floating thing outside of our body, but it was actually deeply connected with our immune system and our hormone system. And not only that, we had ways to start studying things like how our emotions affected our health. So that was really neat. And that was the field I grew up in. But I think for me, because of my personal experiences, which, as you know, I detail in the book, kind of sharing the story of my own personal adventures and how they influenced me to study energy healing. I love. Yeah. yeah, long story short, I mean, if folks can read about it more in the book, but there were two things. One was as a singer, I grew up singing around the house, always loved it. And I felt this power of vibration. And it really made me curious about studying sound and music. And back at Columbia, when I talked about that, everybody thought that was controversial, studying music. Now, of course, you know, there are millions of dollars of NIH grants for that, thank goodness. But when I had my first Reiki session, it was so palpable for me. Like literally I could feel the energy and I could feel the connection with thoughts and emotions and things I needed to let go of. And then the scientist in me was like, oh, I could study the nature of this vibration and I bet it would be really helpful for patients. So that set me on my own journey to do randomized controlled trials and healing as a graduate student and then beyond at UCSD and UCLA. And then I began meeting other scientists who were also deeply interested in this question, but weren't necessarily advertising it out loud with all their colleagues in academia. And long story short, through, you know, kind of building and bridging our communities, we realized we really needed to support the scientists doing this work. And we formed the nonprofit Consciousness and Healing Initiative, or CHI for short, and, you know, in the beginning to really help support these scientists just to provide community initially so we could talk about our findings and share them and share them out with the public. We've published special issues, as you might know, in biofield science and healing. We try to support our scientists with funding when we can, and we also support them with community. So what I would say is, you know, from then to now, from a child to, you know, now having been in this field for 25 years or so, I'm really excited for the future of it. I do think that we need significant investment. We need to help people understand what this is so they're not scared of it or think it's weird because it's really not. It's really just telling us about how powerful we are as human beings to heal ourselves and others. And so I kind of maintain this excitement and enthusiasm because I can just see the future of what this means for humanity. Um, It's really wonderful. And of course, as you know, in the book, I detail so much about the science. I mean, I think there are over 700 peer-reviewed references in there um, because I am a data nerd, but I want people to know there's a real science behind this and it's growing and that's really great. Well, I totally nerded out on your book because I'm so, you know, obviously I've been researching the power of, uh, you know, our innate healing ability and how to access it and how to get out of the way and you know, and, and just all of the things. And it's, it's so thank you for compiling the 700 references <laughs> and the studies, because there are some mind blowing studies in there that, you know, it's very difficult to get to the mainstream. And so, you know, I, I already have a knowing of, of this capacity to heal and how, you know, we're so much more powerful than we've been taught or conditioned to believe because of this kind of materialist or, or reductionist or separatist or whatever you would call it a medical model. Yeah. And, and so I just, I appreciate your book just gave me another appreciation of Reiki because you, you described your experience as kind of when she initiated you, you, you felt bliss. I mean, she literally opened your crown chakra and reconnected you to source energy. And that's, so it, it opened my eyes. And then, you know, ironically enough, my hair girl was doing my hair. And she's like, I just got initiated in Reiki and she had a similar experience. I'm like, what is happening? (laughs) Um, But that's just how the universe works. You know, it's very cool. So all of your studies, you know, and and what you, what you talk about in your book really grounds what I already knew in science. And so let's first just kind of give a overall, what, what is a biofield? What do you You do? So there are many ways of describing the biofield, but I think the simplest way is really to talk about it in the plural, biofields, because these are fields of energy and information that connect us and heal us. That's really the simplest explanation. Now, if we want to put science talk around it, we can say massless fields, not necessarily electromagnetic, that guide the homeodynamic functioning of a living organism. Okay, so that's that's kind of the standard definition that was created a couple of decades ago at NIH when a group of scientists got together and said, what is this that we're finding? Because 
let's break that down a little bit. We can look at the biofields of cells and we know that when we do things like manipulate voltage gradients, things that we can measure, we can manipulate the voltage across the cell membrane and we can grow new tissue, even new neural tissue. That's the work that's coming out of Tufts University, for example, in regenerative medicine. So that's part of the biofield and biofield science and how it's being applied. Then there are biofield devices, right? And I have a free ebook actually that I've given for part of um, you know my thank yous for people who purchased the book on my website because it was 75 pages long and sounds true said shamani this isn't a chapter this is an ebook in and of itself so biofield devices is another really lively way that we're exploring how we can work with biofields to foster healing and there are many different kinds and there are these subtle aspects of the biofield you know you mentioned reiki earlier that's part of it that ancient traditions have described for millennia and they describe it as being fundamental to understanding our healing process. So when we talk about things like prana, chi, when Reiki practitioners talk about universal life energy, these are subtle aspects of the biofield that we can work with to foster our healing and others. So we can look at the biofields of cells, we can look electromagnetically, we can look at the biofields between people, and we do that when we study things like Reiki and laying on of hands and healing touch. We can even study the biofield of the earth and our connection with the earth, which we're doing in grounding studies, as you well know, I'm sure. So what I love about it is it's teaching us that we are bioelectromagnetic beings, that we are vibratory beings. Of course, people say this all the time. We have the experience of it. And now the science is exploring just how deep and wide it goes. And, and what I love about it, especially in this time, is it's teaching us um, how connected we are that this idea that I'm separate from you and that my emotions have no bearing. First of all, <laughs> the idea that our emotions had no bearing on ourselves and our health was just wild and that we're beyond that now. Thank goodness. Thank God. But maybe my emotions and my ability to send you love while being full in my own being has a powerful effect on you because the biofluid teaches us that we're not separate. So, so it's wonderful. And, you know, I, I talk about the biofield as being a bridge to understanding how consciousness affects healing. And, and I, t I share that story of the Reiki initiation to share that because sometimes people think of these as energy medicine as if they're separate from the spirit. But as you know, Kelly, from all the work you've done, I mean, what I've discovered in talking with healers across traditions and across the world is Okay, so how does this work? Like you're working with the energy fields around the body, maybe you're clearing stagnation. You know, all of them see the field differently. Some of them see it as multi-layered, some of it see it as unified, some see auras, some feel it. Some have protocols and processes, some don't. But the number one thing that they all say when you ask them what they're doing is, I am realigning this person with their soul nature, spirit, God, you know, however they describe that, their higher self, because they're the ones doing the healing. I'm just facilitating the process. You know, a lot of my friends don't like to be called healers because they said it's a misnomer. I'm not doing the healing. I'm just facilitating healing in someone else. And so that's what working with the biofield can do is it realigns us back with that soul nature. And I'm so glad you shared that story about your, your friend who said she had a similar experience. I think one of the reasons I decided to share my stories is to give people permission to talk about their own, because I know that my stories aren't unique. And I think when we look at these in a deeper way, we realize that all these practices really, even Tai Chi, Qigong, um, yoga, they're all meant to lead us back to ourselves, back to our innate nature, our spirit, which is really a powerful force for healing. That's really, I mean, in my view, what it's really about. Totally agree. And it's, you know, I've heard about Reiki for years and I was always like, well, okay. And I've had some really powerful Reiki sessions where I felt so relaxed and dropped into my parasympathetic nervous system. And I, you know, intellectually, I was like, oh, well, this is healing, you know, but um, I was never compelled to learn more about Reiki or Reiki one. And I've heard, we have this woman, Patty Penn in our, um, in heal. And she's told me about Reiki one and you should do it. And that's who my hair um, gal went to. And because she said she had this dream or vision that she was supposed to be here or some intuitive told her she was supposed to be healing with her hands and it resonated. So she went and did the Reiki one. And based on what you said in your book, and then, you know, a day later, I'm speaking to her, she had a similar experience and, and how you just described it as like kind of reconnecting 
that, that channel to source energy and, and how you talk about in your book, um, you know, healing versus curing and healing is really this realignment with our source, our wholeness, the, the loving energy from which we come. And, uh, so now I'm like, well, well, shoot, I want to realign. Maybe I'll take Reiki one, you know, just, just yeah. to up level my connection and, and, um, you know, it's like plugging into source. I, I look at it like that. It really is. And what's beautiful. And I do think that learning things like Reiki and having energy healing practices done with you and learning them yourself are really powerful ways to work with the biofield for healing. One of my things, though, is I want people to also understand that your biofield is always with you, right? It's like, may the force be with you. Well, the force is with you, you know, it, it really is. And so there are so many practices from so many traditions that actually teach us how to sense and work with our biofield. You know, I mentioned Tai Chi and Qigong as one and meditation as another and yoga. As you know, those things are being a little bit more studied in mainstream medicine than Reiki, in a way because they lend themselves more to a materialist sort of reductionist viewpoint so the way that people are studying things like yoga and meditation mostly is what happens to my brain what happens to my stress level what happens to my performance and that's all very cool because they have effects on that but in my view like we're missing the boat a little bit in in our study of those things because it's not complete not many studies yet are really looking at what these practices were designed for which is self-realization you know again that coming back to our inner selves so i have many practitioners healing practitioners that say reiki for example is a spiritual practice you know my friend pamela miles describes it like that um, that it's really there's no difference between an energy practice and a spiritual practice and honestly we can approach yoga meditation centering prayer even being out in nature in the same way we can connect our biofields at any moment but it's really helpful to learn skills for sure and there's so many great teachers out there yeah let's talk a little bit about the placebo effect because i want to get into a couple of your studies with you know healing touch therapeutic touch reiki um energy healing uh, but i think it's important to learn to know about the placebo and and just like kelly turner who wrote the forward to your book you know she kind of learned about radical remissions and spontaneous healing. And she's like, why aren't we studying? They're kind of just cast to the side mm -hmm. and, and, you know, doctors are like, well, they're anomalies, you know, and but why aren't we studying them? And I, and I feel it's the same uh, about the placebo effect because there's so much we can tap into and utilize about this placebo effect and, and actually exploit it for our, for our health, you know, uh, yeah. so talk about the placebo effect and then the heal acronym that you came up with. Yeah, you bet. I'm so with you on that, Kelly. You know, well, um, first off, I just want to address this. A lot of people will say, oh, energy healing, that's just placebo. Well, if energy healing is just placebo, then so is surgery. So is, you know, so are drugs. So are all of those things. So let's let's explore this for a minute. What we know is that what we call placebo effects, meaning effects from something that isn't what we consider the active ingredient, like a drug or surgery or acupuncture or energy healing. If we think those are what are driving healing effects separate from this thing called placebo, then that's what we call placebo. And as we explore placebo, here's what we learn. And as you know, I detail a lot of this in my book. Um, first off, we do find what we call placebo effects in every kind of medical <laughs> encounter. That includes looking at things like drugs for depression and pain, but for other things as well, that there is a strong placebo effect. How strong? Well, in the case of antidepressants, our colleagues at Harvard have done systematic meta-analyses of lots and lots of studies. And what they determined was for mild to moderate depression, 75% of the effect of antidepressants and drugs can be attributed to what we call placebo and natural history effects. So 25% to the actual drug itself. And they've replicated this study actually with unpublished FDA data and found that the percentage was I think 82%. So, you know, that's pretty powerful. And it doesn't mean that it doesn't, we can look at that as antidepressants don't work for my depression. Oh God, what do I do? Or to your point, we could say, oh my gosh, we can remit our own depression with our own consciousness right? Yeah. But not only that, we find that placebo effects 
are rampant across surgery. And I detail this in the book where we have two systematic reviews and meta-analyses showing that there are super strong placebo effects in most types of surgery. And I'll describe, you know, in the book, I describe exactly what do we mean by placebo surgery, you know, but essentially these people are entered into a randomized controlled trial. They don't know which group they're going to be in, but they know they're going to get something and then they'll be told afterward what they get. And they go through the surgery process. They go under with anesthesia. They may even get like a fake incision as if it looks like they got surgery. They come out, they're told they get surgery, and then we measure their outcomes. And these folks get better, even though they didn't really have the surgery. So that seems mind blowing to people. And of course, we see these effects in acupuncture and in other forms of integrative health and healing. If we break down what placebo is, though, it's really our consciousness driving the healing effects. And so in in science, the way we've studied this is we've parsed it out into different elements, right? So there's expectation, what my conscious mind expects, like, do I think this medicine or this surgery or this, you know, supplement is going to help me, right? So that's expectation. And then conditioning is literally like, the body mind learning response. So if I got on a Reiki table, and I had a good experience, then the chances are the next time I get on that Reiki table, my mind body already expects and starts conditioning itself, my sympathetic nervous system might sort of dampen down my parasympathetic nervous system might ratchet up a little bit because I'm expecting that I'm going to go into a relaxation response, my body starts doing that that's conditioning. Then there's relationship, there's so many studies now showing that even positive interaction of a doctor with a patient can up level a healing outcome even down to the common cold and when doctors expect that their patients get better their patients tend to get better quicker we've noticed that too and then there's ritual which is in everything that we do in medical encounters and spiritual practice and of course we know about the shamans and the kind of beautiful practices of ritual that they would do to invite spirit into the healing process. That's really why they would do the rituals that they would do. But we have rituals in modern medicine. We go, we check into the front desk, we go get our blood pressure taken and our weight done. We wait until a nurse comes in, gets our vitals, and then the doctor comes in with a white coat. That's all ritual. And some of you may have heard of white coat hypertension syndrome. (laughs) That may not be a very helpful ritual because sometimes when we see that white coat, some of us, our blood pressure goes up, right? But that's a ritual. So what I say is these are present in every healing encounter and they have massive effects on our physiology and our psychology, our healing process. So we could look at placebo really as what I call heal holistic elements that activate life force and i know some people don't like the term life force but i use it because i think it really does have an effect on our energy so when we look at heal what it means is if all these effects are as powerful as the data is showing us we can use these at any time to up level our healing and i go through a whole process of how to do that in the third part of my book the healing keys we can essentially harness our consciousness to first come into presence, understand what our desires are for healing, open to guidance and wisdom, ask for support, create our healing rituals, surrender to the outcome. And when we go through this process, we're essentially harnessing these heal elements. We're setting our expectations, we're creating conditioning, we're formulating a ritual that works for us, and we're fostering relationship with others who could be our healthcare practitioners, our friends, and even spiritual guidance. So there are a lot of ways that we can use what we call so-called placebo elements for our own healing. And I will just say this last thing about placebo, which is that when we look at energy healing, sure, these elements are having an effect because they're just fundamental parts of good medicine, okay? But we've also done these placebo controlled trials that are telling us that the energy that's happening here that's literally getting under the skin is beyond these elements it's actually beyond what we're calling a placebo effect. So we can think of the placebo is not an either or but a both and we want to create the context and the conditions for success and then we work with and up level our energy for even more powerful healing. That's the way I see it now, based on all the data. Yes, and, and, I, and I think it's so important to know because some people just say, oh, placebo, it's all in your mind, and then your body does, you know, uh, it heals because of the power of the mind. Well, but your brain is actually releasing the actual chemistry that that drug or pill 
or treatment would be releasing um, on its own. So it's like our brain is our best pharmacy. And if yeah. we can learn and become aware of, you know, these heal uh, the holistic elements activating life force and the placebo effect, we can, whether we're, you know, actually doing a surgery, uh, having to go through something like chemo, we can do all these other things to activate our life force energy to have the best outcomes and the lowest amount of side effects or speed healing, et cetera. Absolutely. And we're finally coming into a time where we are tired of these models that tell us we have to either believe in science or spirituality. And that if we want to do these things like harness our own mind bodies for healing, that that means we're anti conventional medicine. That's just simply not true. And a lot of the ways, as you know, that these practices are being used as is integrated into healthcare. And that's what we're really striving for with our work with the nonprofit, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative, is to help people understand it doesn't have to be an either or. You can choose to go through any treatments that you want and use these heal effects and use what I call the healing keys to uplevel your healing. It doesn't have to be a choice. They've always worked together because we're a whole system. We work spiritually as well as physically. Those things are connected deeply, as you know. <laughs> exactly, yes. And so, I mean, there's so many studies that I think are so powerful about energy healing or therapeutic touch or healing touch. Um, can you, will you tell us, pick one of the, pick one of the ditties, either your study at UCSD or the therapeutic touch on the bone growth and cancer cells, because what, what I'm most fascinated about is when we are tapping into energy and working with biofields, they're intelligent, uh, which is really, you're just kind of in that connection of consciousness. It is, it's amazing. These fields are intelligent because I would say they're driven by consciousness. Again, with, that's why we describe them. You know, a lot of people say, well, Shamini, why are you guys using the word biofield? Like we've already coined this, it's energy medicine. That's what you're talking about. But some of our scientists don't like that. And I wanna explain why, because when we are studying this, we're realizing that sometimes, you know, we've seen this certainly anecdotally, and I describe, you know, powerful healing in my book, as you know, with Mira. We actually just did an interview with Mira and her dad, which we're putting on, you know, the the Chi uh, YouTube channel so people can watch it there. Um, it's incredible. And in a nutshell, I want people to know this because it's important as we get to the therapeutic touch work. Mira was an example of a childhood cancer survivor. She was two years old when she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Her parents straight away got her into surgery and radiation. They got the tumor out. The radiation caused some developmental delays. And a few months later, she had a recurrence. The recurrence came back in her brainstem in a place where they couldn't operate. They said, if we operate here, then, you know, she could die. And if we radiate further, she could have further damage. So the parents had basically thought there's nothing left to do. And then their friend recommended an energy healer whose name was Sarah who lived in Israel. She was a Holocaust survivor. And her story is amazing. As you know, Kelly, I describe it in the book. Her own story as a healer is amazing. Long story short, six months after working with Sarah, Sarah's in Israel. They're in California. She's working with them at a distance. Mira's tumor completely remits. In a few months, her tumor is shrunk from the size of a quarter to the size of a dime. A few months later, the tumor is completely gone. And the doctors say, we have no idea what happened. This is certainly a miracle. We're not averse to believing in miracles. So this speaks to what, you know, Kelly talks about with radical remission. Well, what happened? And how does it relate to the biofield? If we were to call what Sarah did energy medicine, it doesn't make sense from the definition point of view because energy drops off at a distance. That's how we define it. So when we say biofield, we're opening to the possibility that there is an intelligence behind this field and we don't understand all the mechanisms. As you know, I go through a few potential mechanisms in my book. We know that based on stories like that and data, lots of data, which as you know, I detail, these fields are having effects. So there's information being carried in these fields. It's not just blind energy. So, you know, which really begs the question of how effective devices are gonna be long-term, but that's a whole other, you know, point of discussion. <laughs> To your question about what we're learning with the cell studies, back to placebo, a lot of people say, okay, well, if, there, if this isn't really a placebo effect, then we should see effects on cells and animals because there's probably no placebo effect there. I won't get into that. It all depends on how you define consciousness, you know, but let's just go with that for a minute. Let's just say, okay, 
if energy, if this energy slash biofield is real, then we should see effects on cells. So we have colleagues that have been doing research on that. Gloria Gronowicz is one at the University of Connecticut. She's done several studies looking at this and what she discovered using therapeutic touch compared to mock healing models was that therapeutic touch would actually increase the, the growth of specific bone tissues, right? And bone cells. And when she looked at those effects on cancer cells, it had the opposite effect. So it would actually stimulate growth in healthy cells, but it wouldn't stimulate growth. It would actually inhibit growth in cancer related cells. Fast forward to some of the work that's being done now at MD Anderson Cancer Center, where Dr. Lorenza Cohen, who is the, you know, the head of research at the Integrated Medicine Program and has been for decades at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. He's a great colleague and friend and part of our scientific advisory council, as is Gloria. They have published already two studies looking at mouse models of cancer. These are carefully controlled standard procedures that they would use, for example, if you were gonna be looking at the effects of a drug on cancer growth or cancer spread. And they found in the first study that a trained bioenergy healer compared to a sham actually reduced the growth of a tumor in mice models of cancer, all the way down to inflammatory cytokine levels, those are immune transmitter levels, cell subsets, and even protein signaling pathways, looking at protein kinase levels. They then replicated that study, and this time they didn't see a reduction in tumor growth, they saw a reduction in tumor spread, that is a redu reduction in metastasis. Same effects on the same cytokines, same and similar effects on cell subsets and the protein kinase levels. And those actually link to similar patterns that were found at Harvard with Qigong practitioners who also found this, these intelligent effects of energy on cells. So we're seeing this out of at least three labs at this point using slightly different models of cancer and healthy cells that the biofield emitted from a human being or say going through a human being has an intelligence to it. It's carrying information. And we know now that we're seeing these effects downstream all the way to the cellular level, all the way to cell signaling levels. Do we fully understand how it works? Absolutely not. But that's why we need to invest in the research because this is so incredible. People are trying to develop drugs to do what we're doing right now with energy. So, you know, this is where I stand back like you, Kelly, and I say, why aren't we paying more attention to this? I mean, this is why Tammy Simon, the, the founder of Sounds True, asked me to write this book yeah. because she said people need to know about this work. Absolutely. And it's, it's, a, it's a sad and a shame, but, you know, we're heading in the right direction and more lights are being shown on, on, on your work and, and the science behind these real uh, healing modalities. And it's funny, I actually know Sean Harabans. Um, oh, great. Which is so cool. I've just, uh, <laughs> in the last year, was connected to him. And when you said in the book that these mice, you know, when he comes in the room, they were like huddle in the glass, like yeah. towards him. They, they yeah. literally felt the connection through the field. And then they tried to duplicate that behavior in mice with other healers or other sham healers that would come into the room in similar size and shape to Sean. And they wouldn't. So that these mice were, were conditioned to the, his healing and then wanted more of it. And they were feeling that just energetically. And that's, I mean, that's just a powerful demonstration in itself. It is. And it, it helps us understand what the power of consciousness is here. You know, just a short story that the first time I met Deepak Chopra, I was fundraising for our first meeting in biofield science and he caught wind of it. I get this email saying, please let's meet. And I thought, oh my gosh, okay. Deepak Chopra <laughs> wants to meet me. I'm not going to say no. So I sat in his office for about two hours. It just got grilled to the bone. You know, it was this amazing meeting. And I shared my passion and enthusiasm for the biofield and biofield science. And he was lovely and said, and you know, we've become good colleagues and friends since, and he's been a wonderful supporter of the work. And he said, Shamini, I totally support you in what you're doing. And we'd be happy to help support this meeting. But you know, in the end, it's all consciousness. And of course I laughed and I said, but of course you're gonna say it's all consciousness, you know? <laughs> But I understand what he's saying because, you know, if we go back to Vedic tradition, for example, and other ancient traditions, in the Vedic and Tantric tradition, we describe, you know, the totality of consciousness, the big C consciousness. Sometimes it's described as the Shiva principle, right? The divine masculine. And that way, one could even liken the biofield 
to the divine feminine or the Shakti principle. So if consciousness is basically the formlessness, right, that we're all connected to, we're all one, then the biofield is what brings consciousness into form. And so when we think about those mice, they're part of that big C consciousness, right? And they're feeling that biofield because they are conscious. You know, from that point of view, cells are conscious. So we're all consciously connected and the biofield is what helps connect us. Oh, so many things in your book, but just, yes, this big C and little C consciousness and how, again, us tapping back into that field, that source consciousness, uh, you know, our, our complete wholeness of our soul, spirit, whatever you want to call it, reconnection with God um, is, is the key to healing. You explain things in the book in such a, in such a like aha way, again, <laughs> things that I've heard about before, but you say it, for instance, like karma, karma are energetic imprints of information stored in our subtle energetic bodies, our subtle body based on habits of thoughts, emotions, and actions, or thoughts, emotions, and deeds. So just when you put karma in that, it, it brings it down to reality, day-to-day yeah. reality. So it's not some far off spiritual or religious concept. It's like, oh, my, I'm getting imprinted with my daily thoughts, be- beliefs, emotions, actions, and they're going to be stored in my energetic body. And, and ultimately, I'm going to have to have them cleared by a practitioner or through my own breath work or whatever, but um, it's, it's, it just put it in such a practical, real, energetic, informational, intelligent way. And that's going to change my life. Cause I'm like, Oh, whoa, I am like imprinting karma on my <laughs> field right now. I better choose better. I better choose wisely. I better choose with compassion and love. You know what I mean? Yeah. Thank you for that. You know, I, I will share, you know, as you, as you know, I've been, I've been doing this work, you know, as a scholar and, and a practitioner for about 25 years. And being a scientist, I cogitate a lot, right? So I would always be like, I was holding these ideas and these understandings from the ancient Vedic and Jan and Buddhist and, you know, these traditions that described all these different subtle energy fields and karma and all that. And then I was listening to these healers and hearing them talk about it. And then I had that aha moment where I was like, oh, when they're talking about moving stuff out of the field, and you know our traditions are talking about sanskaras or karmic imprints now it makes sense this is why the healers say i'm working on the karmic level and of course now we're learning why they say we're working on the dna level because of epigenetics which is a whole other discussion but these things are linked so absolutely what's so beautiful about this is that the biofield teaches us that it's constantly dynamic okay so that's the good news so we don't have to freak out about karma because we're constantly changing our biofield is constantly changing. We're in the world. Everything I see, do, think is affecting my field in a positive way as well as a negative way. But that means, again, that I have great power because when I engage in a spiritual practice, I'm gathering the energy to spin off the karma that I no longer need. That doesn't serve my soul's purpose. And that's how energy healing can help us. That's how meditation can help us because we're literally cohering our biofields, connecting them with our soul's energy, if we consider that the big C consciousness, what people describe as the soul, the spirit, however we describe that, it's limitless. Its energy is limitless, right? So when we connect with that limitlessness and that light literally shines through, you know, you can say the karmic level of our field, we can spin off those habit patterns, you know, those old thoughts and behaviors, even traumas, that don't serve us anymore. They literally become lifted from our field. That's why we feel lighter after a healing session sometimes. I'm sure people have had that experience. So it's really neat to see how all these things come together. The ancient wisdom around the biofield has always been there. We just haven't really had the opportunities much to talk about or bridge the modern concepts of the biofield with the ancient ones. And and that's part of what I'm really jazzed about doing. And, and there was another simple thing that you said, and, and I forgot where this came from, but it was just this simplicity of when you're working with a practitioner, someone say they're going through cancer treatment or their, their life force is depleted in some way because they are out of harmony, they are out of balance, they are dealing with some level of dis-ease. Um, so they are at a lower energy uh, capacity. And so when you bring in a healer doing energy work, they're transmitting that their own powerful biofield and energy stores because they're just a channel. A lot of them are channeling divine energy. They have that open channel. So they're just tapping into that infinite 
source of energy. It's like a, you know, charging cord of an iPhone. Exactly. No, it's a great way of putting it. We say that often, just like you need to charge your phone, you need to charge your field. (laughs) You need to charge your field. So that's why tapping into some of these practitioners when you're going through something is absolutely not only, you know, I would highly recommend it, but it's, it's a way to get your life force as you're going through something and, and, and making the changes in your lifestyle. And, um, you know, whether it's, you have to do surgery or drugs or whatever to, to, to get that extra support energetically from someone or something Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's so smart. Yeah, it really makes sense. And then we realize how, how important it is and why the data says that social support, all kinds of support, spiritual support is so important because if we're going with what we've learned from the biofield, right, that we're all connected, that we're not separate, that we're all part of a larger sea consciousness, then when we go through traumas, when we go through, um, you know, grueling, grueling times, and we're all kind of in grueling times right now, right? This has been a really great life lesson for all of us in the pandemic to help understand how deeply we're connected. So we don't have to just spread emotional contagion in negative ways. <laughs> we can spread emotional contagion in positive ways. And when we connect with the energy healer to help boost us, it's because we're connected that we can do that. And guess what? When we fill our well, then we can help fill the well of someone else. But we've got to be okay with asking for support and filling our well. One of the spiritual lessons that I think we all learn when we go through the healing journey is that beautiful balance of giving and receiving. Because you know, what I found a lot are patients that tend to get really worn out are the ones that tend to be on output or giving a lot. And this is where the whole wounded healer thing comes from too, right? We forget to receive. And so when we open ourselves to receiving, you know, first of all, that's a beautiful thing. It, it drives us to our sense of self-love. And when we have that really deep sense of self-love because we're allowing ourselves to receive because we love ourselves enough and ourselves here is the is all of it. It's our small selves and it's our large selves. We receive and then we can give from a full cup. And then we're not, you know, kind of continuing to embody the wounded healer archetype because it is time, you know, for all the healers that are listening. I know you're nodding and smiling in agreement right now that we have to move beyond the wounded healer archetype now. It's now it's the time. Yes. And so many studies have been done on isolation and lack of connection as a, you know, a, a bigger precursor to premature death than even tobacco or excessive alcohol. So, which is why, you know, the way that we kind of handled this pandemic was so devastating because people were isolated and they're, you know, it's just like so heartbreaking. But if you think, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that social connection, there's so much science behind how just social connection and receiving that love, whether it's from a practitioner or your loving, supportive family and friends when you're going through something or finding those doctors that speak to you and keep your hope up and, and, and interact with you in a loving way, all of that makes a difference. So as many people go, well, how do I find the right energy healer? Or how do I know that they're not a snake oil salesman or just in, in your studies, you show that even the people that were receiving sham healing, a lot of them felt that they were getting healing energy because of just the basic level of social connection and that loving, they were receiving love from that person, you know, putting their intention on them. So, you know, what I would say to that is just really tune into, are you feeling loved and supported and know that at that that base level, as you explore and find your healers who will inevitably come to you when you're setting that intention and asking God or the universe for that to come to you, um, just just that connection of love is is healing yeah. in its own right. It really is. And what we've learned from the data is it is about quality, not about quantity. So it's not about the number of Facebook followers. It's not about any of that. It's And what we've learned too from the biofield, just really quick, we're writing up a study looking at the effects of distant sound healing on, on anxiety during the pandemic, where we found profound effects of people getting sound healing at a distance through Zoom. These folks met criteria for generalized anxiety disorder and after three sessions actually dropped to levels below criteria for generalized anxiety. So the biofield teaches us that we're connected even when we're separated in space. And the data shows us that the quality, not the quantity matters. So what that means for us is, and I have some meditations, Kelly, that I share that are on Insight Timer and on my website and things like that. We can do a five minute practice, literally of tapping into our hearts to open to support 
And that can be, you know, opening our hearts to support from the people around us, as well as spiritual guidance. And it will really have a profound effect on our mental and emotional health, but our physical health as well. There's so many studies showing that. So absolutely, for anyone listening that, you know, does feel alone, know that you're never alone. And all you need is any trusted connection, anything that lifts your heart, any person that lifts your spirit, even a pet, even the trees in the backyard. Those are those are places and people and and beings to connect with. So know that you're never alone. So beautiful. Yeah. Never alone. That's Deepak's new foundation to. Connect yeah. With. Yeah. And, and said that for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> we so, really aren't. We're never alone. We're never alone. Uh, two more questions, because I think they're amazing. Um, healing power of creative expression. You started as a singer, then you stepped away from it with your uh, scientific kind of ambitions and, and education and, and research focus. And then you realize that you were missing a part of yourself and, and that creative expression. So you started a heavy metal cover band called <laughs> Nuns and Moses, <laughs> which I love, and then went on to do something like, uh, you know, Iron Maiden cover band. You are a heavy metal singer. What is going on? <laughs> you know, I love singing. I love singing everything. And this is when I think when you give yourself up to the creative force and you just allow it to express itself through you, you don't know where it's going to take you. And I remember my healing teacher once said that her her guidance said the way to enlightenment, the path through enlightenment is through the ridiculous. And so I just really embraced that. So long story short, I followed my desires, which is I had always wanted to do a rock cover band. And I remember calling my friend, long story short, I had to abridge the story a little bit in the book, but I ended up being front row center for a Guns N' Roses show. This was before, this was Axl Rose's boy band before the band actually got back together. But I called my friend and I said, you know, I always wanted to do a Guns N' Roses cover band just for fun. I wanted to do it. And he said, well, you know, dude, we're getting old. So if you want to do it, you better do it soon. And I thought, why not? So I just, you know, went on Craigslist of all things, started calling out musicians, didn't know anyone and, you know, downloaded this name Nuns and Moses for the Guns N' Roses cover band, came out as Moses for part of the show and sang the songs from his brain. I mean, it was just complete ridiculous fun. Didn't know that the San Diego tribute scene was actually really serious. <laughs> so meanwhile, they're all like, who is this woman? Like, what is she doing? We ended up being a Jeopardy question, actually, I found out later. It was just hilarious that you, you we didn't know where it was going to go. It was just fun. And then when I got asked to sing in the Iron Maiden tribute band that was forming, I thought, oh, Iron Maiden, I don't really listen to heavy metal. Like, what is this about? And and as I talked with my husband, who's also a musician, he said, oh, they're incredible musicians. They've got to be really good musicians. That's very intricate music. So I thought, OK, I'd give it a try. And again, I made it my own. And the point of it being, you know, I was in my 40s when I did that. So for anyone who feels like you lost your creative expression or whatever, I just want to share with you, it's not too late. It was very joyful for me. I mean, now I find myself singing more of Joni Mitchell and I'm finally writing my own songs. And it's just a journey because what it did for me is it just opened me up to realize that I don't have to leave a part of myself behind. And what I also realized is how powerful the creative energy is and how healing it is for us. And I mean, not only does it give us energy and yes, we can express all kinds of things, emotions, and you know, we can express the state of the world through our art and the state of ourselves. But more than anything, we're literally tapping into the creative force that is in all of us. It, it's literally what gives us life, right? And that is so powerful. So many scientists, psychologists, other people have spoken about this, you know, and and it has a little bit of a shadow side to it sometimes in the way that it's been explored or discussed, but there's no shadow to it. It's your birthright and you choose to express it any way you want. So even creating a cool meal, making something up from the refrigerator, wearing an outfit that expresses your feelings at the time, that's all creativity. And the data shows that every day that we're creative is a day that we actually have more positive mental health. There's research around this. So I really encourage people to do anything creative, it doesn't matter, like write in a journal, write a poem, draw a stick figure, like, you know, play with your kid and do something creative with your kid. You will see the effects on your health if you do that. As you're talking about this, I'm getting another light bulb aha moment. Uh, this is why I love your work. But, you know, I've talked about this a lot in Heal. A lot of people, you know, there's a moment in time where you kind of 
poo poo your creative gifts and you go the, the safe route or society's expected route or what your parents want you to do or the responsible thing. And that's when, as Jeffrey Thompson and, and Heal says, that's when disease starts to, mm -hmm. to unravel because you are shutting down a part of yourself and your creative expression. And as you're talking, it's almost like just as if like a Reiki initiation connects you to your source, your creative gifts, your creative expression, whatever you're inspired to do is actually that open channel to source energy flowing yeah. through you. So of course your health is going to be more vital. And that's mm -hmm. why play and creative expression is so important as, as a heal, as not only for a healing journey, but also for preventative medicine, every yes. day we need to incorporate play and creative expression. And you don't have to, you know, if you're raised in a family of lawyers or doctors and you want to go down that path, just as long as you don't lose whatever brings you joy creatively, you can still do that mm -hmm. on the side. You could live a very vital, purposeful life, you know? And, you know, I know doctors, I have a friend who's a doctor who just started playing flute again after stopping it around age 13. And she's so excited for it because, and ev I'll tell you, all the scientists I talk to, I find out they're closet musicians. And all the musicians I talk to, I find out are closet scientists because we all have these aspects of ourselves. When I started singing heavy metal and everybody realized what work I did as a scientist and with our initiative, they started coming and telling me about their fantastic stories of healing and their philosophies of consciousness. Everyone is really deep, you know, like if you start talking to people, everyone has all of these facets. And so absolutely, we have to give ourselves permission to be ourselves. And part of the gift of creativity is that it does bring authenticity. It does allow us to express all parts of ourselves and not feel like we have to hide them away. I'll tell you a really quick story before we end, just so people know that the struggle is real. <laughs> In my 40s, when I started fronting this Iron Maiden tribute band, and I will admit, like some of my scientific colleagues thought it was hilarious. Others couldn't understand it at all. And they were like, what are you doing? My father was definitely in this camp. And at one point, he was so upset that I was doing this. And he said, you're going to ruin your career. And like, what are you doing? All the stuff you've been building up and healing. And now you're singing these heavy metal songs on stage. And, you know, and I mean, he literally practically threatened to disown me. <laughs> At one point, I was like, what? I'm in my 40s. Like, like, I understand that you don't think this is acceptable. But, you know, this was a process. So this just shows how socially ingrained we are in those ideas of separatism that we feel threatened sometimes to, or other people may feel threatened when we express ourselves fully. Mm. And yet we will find our own way and our own liberation as we do it, it's a journey. Like I said, now I sing heavy metal less just cause it's not really as strongly in me. I find myself just where I am, you know, in this moment in time and even the environment around me wanting to sing things that are a little bit more flowing and soft because that's part of my learning process now is learning how not to push and how to flow. But you got to start where you are. Yeah. So, yeah, and thank you for just reminding people that when you do that, when you honor your your creativity and your authenticity, you open the pathway for powerful healing. That's really the point. Yes, and if healing is coming back to wholeness or realign, you know, realigning with your wholeness, that's an aspect of yourself that needs to be fully expressed. That authentic expression is part of wholeness and healing. So. Thank you for that story. I know, and and we could talk forever, but when you saw that healer, Clara, who you know noticed this kind of blocked energy behind your throat, and it made you wake up to the fact that you know maybe the heavy metal music uh, could be affecting you know the health of your throat because it's so forceful, and then that woke you up to the reflection of the rest of your life where you were trying to do 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 too much as a mom and a scientist and a wife and and you were just forcing through ego and ambition um which you know it's not that you were egoic and ambitious to like a fault but it was such a good reminder for myself because i'm raising a two-year-old child now and we we do have ambition we do have our ego and we do want to strive for goals but um it it's just a reminder that sometimes you have to soften and and listen more to Joni Mitchell or or practice you know like mother teresa said you say this quote in your book if you want to change the world go home and love your family so that's what it's about yeah that really is it's about just coming back into love and 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 so i love surrender as you know it's the last part of my healing keys not because it's Last, it's actually the most important step. My friend, Alyssa Rankin actually has now described surrender as the first part of her path. You know, so however we describe it, surrender is just about 
recognizing that we all have desires and ambitions and we want to do good things in the world all of us that are listening here want to do good things you know the ambition isn't necessarily always just for ourselves but it's for the world and yet when we are constantly living in that driven push 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 place we are moving from doing and not from being and so we're actually less effective so surrender is about literally coming back into being right it's coming back into being and then what's beautiful about that and i'm learning this every day and i think a lot of my friends are learning this every day is we're moving sort of from the wounded masculine models into the divine feminine models of leadership we realize that much more happens when we flow from being versus doing it doesn't mean there aren't things we have to do lunches need to be made for the kids dinner needs to be made homework needs to be done you know paperwork needs to be filled out you know all these things need to get done but when we can approach those from a state of being through surrender and realizing that we're just part of the process it's not about us it's never been about us and we don't have to you know move from a place of unworthiness or unlovableness or any of that we're we're really deeply connected we're just all part of the process and and that's where you know all of the magic happens that's how we're going to realign our world amen thank you for that last question um the jan uh kind of culture or spiritual uh path is about nonviolence. so how and it's called ahimsa is that what it's called that's right yes how do you practice ahimsa with spiders and mosquitoes well, we catch them and put them outside. <laughs> spiders just give me the EVGV. Oh, I know. Oh, well, okay. So my kids grew up in Southern wanna... California and we recently moved to the South, back to the South. And so they're just encountering a lot of bugs for the first time in their lives. So when we hear those blood curdling screams, we know that we have to go downstairs and catch a spider. Um, but you know, that's what we do. Mosquitoes are hard. I mean, they bite me like crazy. They're usually too quick for me to do anything about them. So, you know, obviously oils and things like that. Everyone has their line, okay? That's the point. I mean, we do we we do have exterminators that come when we absolutely need them. And, and I agonize over that sometimes. And, and yet I know the reality that we're trying to set our space and it is what it is. I have spent a lot of my early childhood feeling guilty because I realized that the very nature of my being alive meant that even breathing, I was killing microorganisms. I mean, this is part of what we learn in, in Jainism, right? The point isn't to feel guilty. The point is again to come back to understanding that we're all deeply connected and part of the same consciousness. So if I feel like I don't have to hurt something, whether in thought, word, or deed, right? In all those ways, then I get to make that conscious choice. And it does affect my biofield. You know, coming back to that, it comes, it affects my karma, it affects my biofield, it affects my path to spiritual liberation, my healing, right? But it doesn't have to be a heavy thing, it's a joyful thing because I can look at that spider and say, Oh, you're so cute. Don't bite me. I'm going to try to catch you and put you outside where you belong and, you know, have a great day. And, you know, I could tell you other stories, but I know we're out of time. You know, we've had copperheads come up to the window and kind of stare at us at the window. And, and I've looked at it and just sort of communicated with it and said, what are you here? What do you want? And I feel like it gave me a message. It left and I've never seen it since. Wow. Because I think it also realized that, you know, it's not safe for it to be super close to to our family. So. Wild. Well, um, healing ourselves, biofield science and the future of health is a gift. I love all the science that just strengthens our belief in what we already know. And the last section is the healing keys. You really offer a lot of um, practices that can help us tap into our own innate ability to heal. And I'm taking away so much from the book and um, I encourage everybody to check it out. Where can people find you? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So if you're interested in the book, the easiest place to go and the best place is healingourselvesbook.com, which will also take you to my personal website, Shamini Jan's website. And there, if you order from there, we've got all kinds of cool bonuses, videos with Bruce Lipton and Deepak Chopra and, and Greg Braden and a free ebook and meditations and all kinds of goodies. So do go to healingourselvesbook.com and you get hooked up with all of that. Also join our nonprofit, the Consciousness and Healing Initiative. You can go to chi.is or even go to something easy to remember like webinarsonhealing.com. We have free webinars and ask me anything sessions with leaders in the field every month and they're totally free. So connect in with our community and you know feel supported in your journey and have some fun along the way. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shamani. And uh, it was wonderful having you on the show. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Kelly. 
Thank you for listening to The Heal Podcast. Be sure to tune in for more empowering wisdom and inspiring healing stories. Oh, and make sure you hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss that one episode that holds the answer you've been searching for. And if you feel inspired, we would love you to rate and review us so that we have the opportunity to reach more people. And of course, you can follow us on Instagram for some behind the scenes fun and more inspiration at at Heal Documentary and at Kelly Gore. Thank you so much and be well.